Good morning, and welcome to our Friday Forum. Um, this is our second meeting, so we're excited to be here and glad that everybody has joined us this morning. Um, today, so I'm Ben Nielsen. I'm a product manager. I introduced myself last week, but, you know, I've been with the company for just under a year, and um, and today we're going to have the, uh, Zach Church presenting. He's a principal product analyst, and he's been with the company for uh, 19 years, and he's been working on Ascend almost since the beginning for about six years, so he's a real pro, and uh, we're excited to talk about the clinical decision support using Quick Exam. So we're going to get started here, and, you know, as we did last week, I just want to um, start this poll here. Um, want to know more about who you are. So what's your role in this practice? Let me launch this. Let's see who, who has joined us today and um, see if, you know, make sure that we're targeting our message to the right people, to, to, to you. Make sure that we're catering everything we're doing for you. All right. Looks like most people have answered. So I'm going to share here those results here. Pretty good split between the, all the different types of roles that, that are joined in today. So welcome again. Um, like I said, we have uh, today we're going to be talking about the clinical decision support using Quick Exam. And um, just want to remind you, feel free to ask questions throughout using the question module that you can find here in, in the GoToWebinar. And uh, we'll try to answer them um, at the end. We have we'll have a we'll have a moment for Q and A, so so you can we'll we'll answer all the questions that you have as, for as long as we have until the top of the hour here. So, all right. Okay, so let me just make sure. Okay, so I'm going to turn the time over here to Zach Church, um, our principal product analyst, and he will. Let me. All right, so just one moment. All right, I think we're ready to go now. Okay, Zach, take it away. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, again, uh, I, I'm Zach Church, a member of the development team. Um, I am the principal product analyst for Dentrix Ascend, but basically what that means is that I'm in, involved in the design process for most of the major features that are introduced in, in Ascend, which includes the quick exam module, which I'll be talking about today. And the topic for today's webinar is related to clinical decision support, which is a new feature of quick exam. In order to really appreciate the added benefits of that feature, I'd like to first give a little bit of background on why we have the quick exam module. So soon after we released it, we were asked by a few of our customers why we developed another charting module, especially when that charting module doesn't have the ability to post completed procedures. In order to answer that question, I'd like to talk uh, just for a moment about tools. I recently finished the basement of my house. I built most of it myself, but I started with very, very few con construction tools of my own. And anyone who's worked in construction knows that it requires a lot of wood to do something like finishing a basement. And obviously having tools to cut that wood is, is absolutely required. Uh, but the nature of the tool is different depending on the type of wood you need to cut and for which purpose. I needed a miter saw to cut the two by fours for framing and trim that I used around the floors and doors. I needed a handheld circular saw for cutting wood for countertops and, and wood paneling. I needed a jigsaw for uh, cutting an opening in a countertop or a sink. I needed a reciprocating saw for demolition, et cetera, et cetera. I used each of these saws for cutting wood, but each of them had its own unique and distinct purpose few times when I didn't own the correct type of saw for a task, I tried to unsuccessfully to use a different type of saw for that task, and most of the time it yielded pretty bad results. Now transition back to tools used in your dental office, specifically the clinical aspects of the Ascend software. About two and a half to three years ago, we responded to several comments from a few customers who said that they felt Dentrix Ascend was too slow. Our team is always very concerned and aware of the performance speed and uptime of our servers. So one of our first reactions to this feedback was that something was wrong with our servers or something maybe in the office of our customers uh, was contributing to slowness, you know, internet connection speed or slow computers, et cetera. 
Uh, and after contacting these customers and visiting several of these offices, we discovered that it actually wasn't problems with the slowness of their internet connection or their speeds. It was because it took too many clicks to record a patient exam in the chart. So we first considered making some changes with the workflow of the chart, which at the time was our, really our only tool <clears throat> for entering information for a baseline exam for a new or returning patient. Diagnosing conditions, existing work, uh, you know, creating treatment plans, clinical notes, et cetera. We realized that the workflows are significantly different for charting a new patient, uh, an exam for a new patient, versus completing a procedure here and there while retaining some of the existing benefits of the current chart. So sometimes there's a tendency to want to have a single tool and kind of squish a whole bunch of new features into it with the intent to make it better, but sometimes it has the opposite effect if you try to make that one tool accomplish distinctly different tasks. The workflows we felt were different enough that we determined we needed to have a separate clinical tool specifically for conducting new and returning patient exams. And that tool is the quick exam module. So we established a definite, definite need for a tool that would allow for the quick entry of exams before designing anything, though, we conducted a lot of research. I visited numerous dental offices and observed countless exams for new and returning patients. Many times those exams were recorded on paper. And I was able to observe, observe the, uh, the pain points that were felt by having to perform dual entries sometimes or to make use of other tools outside of dentistry consent, such as paper, in order to fill the, the needs of the office. And with the permission of the providers and patients, I recorded many of those exams so that we could review them back at the office as we designed the feature to make sure that we are designing something that actually met the needs of our customers and could keep up with the speed of uh, the provider dictating their exam findings. I also ordered a few dental learning models. <clears throat> we took them around to a few dentists and asked them to perform kind of a new patient exam on them while we recorded them. Uh, we had them conduct the exam and dictate their findings and uh, their proposed treatment plans, just as they would normally dictate them to a dental assistant. And after analyzing the observations and the recordings and findings and all the paper copies of the documents that we uh, gathered, we then proceeded to come up with designs for that feature that might facilitate that kind of workflow. The initial designs are, are usually quite rough. They usually exist on whiteboards or sketch pads. I have two huge whiteboards in a workroom next to my desk that I fill up with designs like this as we go through different stages of the design process. So the design process is really an, uh, an iterative or repetitive process where we will develop designs, run them by customers, uh, revise the designs, run them by some more customers until we feel the design is ready to have the programming team start working on them. When we run designs, by our customers, we'll typically put together a non-working model that uses just like a series of photo mock-ups that aren't yet coded. And then we'll ask them to perform specific tasks like entering a clinical note or posting a procedure to make sure that the, the interface and workflow can be easily understood. We can see the expressions on their faces. Uh, we can see the paths that they take with their mouse. We record the comments that they make as they use it. Because um, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll express little comments of frustration and um, it's, it's good to have those uh, because we we build on that as we design our software. The chart module continues to have its strengths and the quick exam just brings new strengths to the, to the table. It's like a like a jigsaw and a circular saw. They serve different purposes and have different strengths. The chart is great for seeing a full graphical view of the patient's mouth with the procedures and the conditions shown on the teeth. It's also good for completing procedures. It's larger in size, uh, which it means it's really good for describing concepts to your patients. The quick exam module really is designed essentially for speed, in essence, really to document the details of an exam as fast as the dentist can dictate it. And, and it's really its strength, as I said before, is documenting full mouth exams for new and returning patients. The chart can, continues to really serve a significant role in the clinical record for the patient, and the, and the quick exam is just a different and unique tool in the clinical toolbox that Dentrix has sent. The videos you can see here have both been sped up significantly, as you can tell. Uh, and in these videos, the same exact exam information is documented. <clears throat> in the video on the left, the exam is being documented in the quick exam module. And on the right, that same exact exam is being documented in the traditional chart. The same exact number of conditions, existing work, treatment plan procedures, and clinical notes were posted in both exams. Uh, and to document this very brief new, uh, new patient exam, in quick exam, it, it 
uh, required 40% fewer clicks than using the traditional chart. You'll notice that the quick exam already finished. Um, and uh, it was also 30% faster as far as time is concerned. When it comes to speed, the quick exam module is even faster when you're using a touch enabled device like an iPad or a Surface. The difference in speed really is a compelling reason to use the quick exam for documenting full mouth exams uh, for new and returning patients. Now real quick, I'd like to get into, uh, do a, just a brief uh, demo of some of the features of quick exam before talking about uh, clinical decision support. So here in the quick exam module, um, you know, you'll see that each of the teeth are represented. They're, they're different than it is in the chart. Uh, you still have tooth numbers. Their tooth numbers represent whoever the patient is. If it's a, if it's a, uh, a pedo patient, you're going to have uh, appropriate tooth numbers show up here for the primary teeth. Um, uh, you, you have an exam provider that everything you post while here in the quick exam module will be posted to that provider. You have columns here that represent conditions, existing work, and treatment plan that you will be posting during this exam. You also have image indicators on the teeth, just like you do in the chart, where it'll show the uh, approximate age of the exams that are associated with those teeth. Uh, and you can, as, as you're going through the exam, you can highlight um, uh, one of the teeth as images and view them, navigate between them just uh, as you can in the chart. It, it is especially helpful as you're going through an exam to do that. Um, and I'd like to just kind of do a little bit of a side-by-side -side comparison, posting the exact same things in quick exam as, as it is in the chart, just to show the benefits of using the quick exam for a new and returning patient exam. For instance, I'll, I'll go to tooth number three, and uh, let's just say that this patient has some recession and sensitivity on tooth three, and we'd like to treat and plan a root canal and a pulp cap. So I've got gingival recession and sensitive dentin, and I would like to treatment plan. Actually, I'll turn this off for now. I'll treatment plan um, a pulp cap and our root canal is down here. And so that is now posted and I'm going to go into my chart and I'm actually going to post the same thing in the chart. Um, I'm going to go to my conditions and I'm going to find my uh, gingival recession. I'm going to click on conditions again and find my sensitive dentin and click on procedure. And uh, from here, I've got to find those two uh, procedures for treatment planning a root canal and then also the, uh, the direct pulp cap. So you notice that it requires a few more clicks to do that in the chart, which again, the chart is not optimized for new patient exams like the quick exam module is. Um, a big part of new or returning patient exam is to document existing work. Um, let's just say this patient is missing tooth number 22 um, and there is an existing bridge that, that spans that gap. And uh, so in just a couple clicks, I've documented that. Um, and you'll notice that when I jump to other clinical modules, like I jump to progress notes, those teeth that I had selected in quick exam remain selected. So I can see in progress notes that, um, you know, before I actually had uh, posted a clinical note that was associated with tooth number 21 and it shows here. Um, go to chart if you needed to remain, have those teeth remain selected, you can see them here in the chart. And you'll notice that these things are already posted. I went to quick exam and I, and I charted these things and they're already posted in the patient's record. I'm gonna head over to quick exam again here. Everything that, uh, so I, as I go through the exam, uh, and I select a tooth where previous exam information has already been entered, like uh, tooth number 19, from a previous exam. You can see that these items from a previous exam already show here, and, and you can see the date in which those items were posted, September 12th, 2017. All the colored squares you see in the area above are things that you've documented in today's exam. And so you can, if, at any time, you can see, okay, you've treatment planned four things all together today, and you can click that and toggle over to this list where you can see, okay, you treatment plan some stuff on 2.3 and 2.13, um, and you can toggle back and continue your exam. Um, and just like in the chart, you can post a clinical note from here. Uh, I have tooth 19 selected, and as I post a new clinical note, you'll notice that it automatically associates it with tooth 19. I can go in and say the patient experiences significant pain while chewing, and save that 
uh, again, rapidly going through the patient exam. Um, so the, the list of, of uh, conditions and procedures that are shown here are based on your what flag is your favorite in your procedure and condition settings, but you can still really easily search for something that normally is a little out of the ordinary, like if you wanted to say that this patient um, came in and they have a uh, like a like a steel crown, you can search for that and uh, post that as, as existing work for that particular tooth. Um, so that is just a kind of a basic demo, a high level overview of what the, the quick exam module is, but I want to talk about clinical decision support now. Um, yeah, go ahead. Cool. So we actually have a question. I think maybe now's a good time to just jump in on this question. Um, if the dentist wants to look at an x-ray on a specific tooth while doing the treatment plan, what's the fastest way to get to the x-ray? Uh, if they're doing that while entering a, uh, if they're trying to enter a uh, treatment plan, like if say they want a treatment plan on something on tooth number 19, uh, if I'm going through the exam and, and the dentist says, oh, you know what, can you show me the most recent exam on tooth 19? You click image peak while 19 is selected and it'll show you image peak for 19. And you can see that this is one of the most recent ones that I acquired on tooth 19. It, it kind of it starts with the most recent one and goes backward. And I'm going to go to the next one, which happens to be another one in the same four bite wing series. And so if you're going through the exam and the, the doctor says, uh, you know, if they're visually looking at it and say, I, it looks like there's some decay in here. Can you show me the most recent image? Basically, that's uh, that's when you would say, okay, I'm, I'm on tooth 19. I'm going to go into image peak. So that's that's the way you would view the most recent image as you're uh, actually going through the exam on a specific tooth. And one of the really good things about these color indicators here is that um, you can kind of see how old these are. First of all, you can see if there's an image on it. Uh, you can see that these, I mean, I just acquired this these uh, this four bite wing series and a couple PAs just yesterday. And so these, these are all represented as the black color, which is zero to six months old. This way you know how accurate and how relevant these x-rays are, or images are, to the patient you're looking at. If something is 25 plus months, if it's over than over 20 years, or 20 years, if it's over two years, or the patient doesn't have any images at all uh, on those teeth, it's represented as just a white circle, indicating that, uh, you know what, either the patient doesn't have anything on there, or it's not reliable enough for you to really make a judgment call right now. Hopefully I answered that question well enough. Perfect. Okay, so going back to uh, the presentation, um, what exactly is clinical decision support? So it's it's still a, it's a phrase that's still fairly new and unfamiliar to a lot of us. So what exactly is it? You can find a brief uh, yet still accurate definition of clinical decision support on healthit.gov, which is the office of the national coordinator for health information technology says clinical decision support provides clinicians, staff, patients, and other individuals with knowledge and person-specific information intelligently filtered or presented at appropriate times to enhance health and health care. So really it consists of having a system that guides you toward making more educated clinical decisions related to treating patients who, who have specific conditions. And that's all based on the information you provide, the information you enter into ascend. Guidelines are then applied to that information. And in quick exam, those guidelines are provided in the form of suggested treatment plans for patients based on the conditions that you record, that you diagnose and record. And those guidelines uh, for recommended treatment can be customized for your organization. When a condition is posted, like dental caries or attrition, et cetera, quick exam can display a list of procedures at the top of the treatment plan column, which could potentially treat that condition. All Dentrix to Send customers are automatically provided with uh, a default list of these suggested treatment plan procedures, which is based on guidance that was provided to us by the American Dental Association, as well as actual customer information, customer data. The proposed treatment can be customized, as I mentioned, for you and your organization if there are procedures that you would like to remove from the list or add to the list. And I'll show you that uh, here in a little demonstration of clinical decision support. 
Um, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually de demonstrate posting a condition to a particular tooth here. I'm gonna say that tooth number two is impacted in the uh, mesial. And just as it was before, it just uh, allows me to post a condition pretty quickly, that's great. I'm gonna delete that condition and I'm going to enable clinical decision support, which is done on this menu at the top of the treatment plan column. Show clinical decision support, set to no right now, I'm gonna say yes. So when, I, when I'm on tooth number two here, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna post uh, impacted tooth again. Same exact thing. Uh, now it shows me three proposed, three procedures that are proposed treatment. Um, next to routine extraction here, or all these, all these here, maybe I prefer to do routine extraction, but I click on this info bubble, and it tells me this procedure, D7140, a routine extraction, may be a potential treatment for the condition impact the tooth. So it kind of helps me along the way and, and it shows me this list here. But this one, I may, uh, I may want to customize this list uh, later and I'll show you that in just a few seconds. Um, I'll show you the, another example um, by uh, going to tooth number 15 and posting dental caries. And uh, I'm just gonna say they have caries on MOD and it pops up this list. Um, and uh, this again is a, another list of proposed procedures. Um, I don't really do titanium crowns uh, in my office, but um, which actually isn't on this list. It was on, must have been on another one, but um, I can add and remove items from this. If I wanted to add titanium crowns or wanted to add a different kind of inlay, I'll show you how to do that. Uh, if you click on the little menu here and click on CDS, which is um, Clinical Decision Support Settings for Conditions, you can click on that. You're taken to the Procedure Codes and Conditions page where you can customize this list. I'm going to go into Dental Caries. Do a little search here. I'm going to customize this list and say, you know what, maybe I want to start doing titanium crowns here. And so I'm going to select that and I'm going to try to see if I can do a different type of, I'll do a metallic inlay. And so now I have six procedures associated with dental caries. So that's gonna to propose to me, clinical decision support, it's gonna propose those six the next time I diagnose dental caries on a tooth. Uh, I had mentioned before that maybe I wanted to also uh, customize the impacted tooth option. They'll say, I, maybe I wanna remove this one that's D7230. I'm gonna remove that from the list that, so that whenever I post impacted tooth, I'm only really presented with uh, routine extraction or extraction of a erupted tooth with bone removal. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and then I'm going to return to the quick exam module. And from here I'm going to I'm going to post those procedures. I'm going to go to the tooth 31 and I'm going to say that this tooth is impacted. Same thing. And you'll notice the list here now instead of showing three procedures it shows just the two based on the list that I just customized. And I'll show the other also dental caries on tooth number five and the list over here is augmented with six procedures where previously it only had four so those are the ones that i had specified uh, so using clinical decision support um, really will help you properly document diagnosis conditions uh, quickly and in essence really you um, it's like favorites that are condition specific favorites and uh, and really it can help you by putting the most pertinent procedures uh, right at the very top. Um, and even though quick exam is already really fast, uh, this makes it even faster by, by making it context sensitive to what you had already diagnosed for that patient. Um, so really in essence, that's clinical decision support in quick exam. Um, we've got some, a little bit of time for um, question and answer. And, uh, and Ben is gonna help facilitate that. We've got uh, a bunch here that have been submitted. Let's see. All right, so, so Zach, one of the questions that someone asked about when you were in the, the, uh, the quick exam, one question is, does the image peak work for uh, panos as well? It definitely does. Um, the uh, the idea behind ImagePeak is that it is linked to 
uh, every image that is associated with a tooth uh, will show, you, you can access when you're using ImagePeak. And I, I wish I had a, a pano available where I could show that. Um, but right now, the exam that I showed, the most recent exam for that patient was one that involved four bite wings and two PAs. If I took a, a pano, uh, maybe the pano was older, it would show me the PAs and the bite wings first uh, as I navigate through, or I guess in the situation where I showed it was tooth 19, so it wouldn't show the PAs, it would show the bite wings. But I would go bite wing to bite wing, and then the next one, if my pano was like, you know, last year or something, it would show my pano next. So yes, it would show panos, it would show cefts, it would show intraoral photos if you took them and associated them with the, with those teeth. ImagePeak will show anything that uh, for the selected tooth that happens to be associated with that tooth. All right, great. And and by the way, we have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll hurry and try to answer as many of these as we can. And thank you everyone for the for your participation and and questions here. Um, okay, so Zach, the next one I have here is when when a user updated the procedure code for the clinical support, does it apply for all users? Uh, yes, right now that uh, that setting is organization wide. There is a, a desire in the future to make that actually user specific or location specific. But right now it's an organization wide setting, just like procedure code favorites and condition favorites are currently for your uh, for your organization. Okay. Um, okay, under conditions, when selecting carries, it will automatically, or will it automatically update the appropriate amalgam code? Will it automatically update? Um, not sure I understand that. Hey, can you read that one again? Yeah, so, so it says, under conditions, um, when selecting carries, will it automatically update the appropriate amalgam code? Just see. Oh, okay. I think I think yeah. maybe maybe what's being referred to is uh, like um, where it shows like one service. Maybe that's what the question is. When oh yeah, the, yeah. The clarification. Service. If there, if yeah, if there are multiple services. Yep, definitely. In fact, you notice here it says metallic inlay three surface. Well, if I click on this, we have logic in our system that is smart, so you don't have to put. Uh, amalgam one surface, amalgam two surface, three or four plus. Um, if you put any of the surface related procedures in here, uh, let me let me go with this full porcelain ceramic inlay one surface. So I'm actually going to post that to three surfaces. Um, when I click off, the system is smart enough to say, I uh, you selected you 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 posted this one surface, but you selected three. So we're going to change it to the three. Same thing if I go to this uh, uh, one or I'm sorry this three surface one and I only post one surface. Uh, it'll change it to one surface for me. I go over to progress notes and I can I can see that um, it's posted the correct one. So for our surface procedures, we do have built-in logic that corrects that. If that's, I'm, I'm assuming that that's the question that was asked is if, you know, do we have to put uh, one surface, two surface, three or four in here for clinical decision support? You absolutely don't. You, you just put one of them and it really doesn't matter uh, which one Ascend will know how many services you specify and post the correct one. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, um, the next question here, Zach, is in the quick exam, can you see the previous treatment that you completed on teeth um, for repairs, et cetera? Um, previously completed work? Uh, no, uh, aside from perhaps, like, uh, I'm going to go in, into the, the chart, for example. Um, I'll just I'll say on this particular tooth, um, let's say I completed uh, an MOD uh, amalgam. So on tooth 29, I completed MOD amalgam. Um, when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm in quick exam, uh, going through the, um, going through an exam, and I come to tooth number 29, um, you you can quickly jump over to progress notes to to verify that. Um, that it is something you you yourself have completed, but as far as completed work, um, you know that probably would. I, I can see how that would be helpful if it's if it's something you've completed. If it's something that was done elsewhere, um, that you charted as existing work, it would show in the existing column.
So hopefully that okay. that answered. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, okay, another question here. Can can clinical decision making be used after the patient has been dismissed if conditions are entered using the regular charting method? Um, after they've been dismissed, like after the patient has left your practice, I'm assuming that's what it is. Uh, the clinical yeah. decision yeah. support uh, little prompts are they, they will come up at the moment you actually chart the diagnosis. So if you are if you're on a tooth here and you say dental caries uh, on the occlusal, I opt not to treatment plan anything. I go to another tooth and I come back. Um, we we actually don't show that when you return to the tooth, whether that's that day or whether that's in the future. Uh, the intent is really during the process of the exam, um, as you as the patient is there going through and you're documenting the full like a baseline uh, chart. Uh, so to speak, that's that's when clinical decision support is uh, designed to be used as you're going through tooth by tooth for a patient. So uh, as far as so the answer is, uh, you know, patient has left and going back in and selecting a tooth, it won't show clinical decision support um, at that point in time. And you may have multiple conditions posted for a tooth, but um, anyway, hopefully that answers the question. Okay, cool. And then I think I have a question here that is a little bit of a clarification on, I think that's something you covered. Um, it says, what we've been using charting, so just to be clear, if we used quick exams, would the history of procedures and conditions from charts not show up in quick charts? Oh, they would. Uh, in fact, let me go uh, over to progress notes for this patient. This one I'm not filtering. Uh, let me see, let me find something really old here. Okay, so tooth number 19 had some stuff charted to it had uh, sensitive dentin as a condition. It had uh, two treatment plan procedures and an existing piece of work. That's on tooth number 19. Uh, and as I mentioned before, everything that I'm looking at here that has a colored dot, colored square on it, are things that I've done during today's exam. Now, if I happen to be, as we're going through, you know, tooth by tooth, um, and uh, I select 19, uh, when I select it, I see those things that I posted from a previous exam. So the doctor calls out, ooh, it looks like they've, uh, they've said they have, uh, you know, hypersensitivity on tooth 19. Um, they've also got a two-surface amalgam DO and, uh, you know, treatment plan root canal and, and direct pulp cap. Great. We already had it in the system anyway. Uh, so you, you can see the things that you have, uh, you know, diagnosed and charted previously. All right, let's see. Just reading through. Um, okay, if I want to refer a procedure, I still want to see this as part of my treatment plan. Can this show as part of the plan? Um, well, I'm assuming you mean when you go to treatment plan or all the things that I've documented show as part of the treatment plan? Because everything, as I'm going through quick exam and click, 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 I'm going through treatment planning things, they're all gonna be shown in my treatment plan here. So I can take this and I can uh, organize these in, into visits and into uh, cases as I, as I see fit. But all this stuff is from today's um, exam. All, well, all, all except for those two procedures that I mentioned were posted like a year, a little over a year ago. Um, I think that's what was asked is if what I've what I charted today or you know charted as part of this quick exam if it would be included in treatment treatment plan for the patient exactly it, it absolutely would um, whether you charted it from the chart or from the quick exam module I mean in fact I, you go over to the quick exam or I'm sorry the chart right now you look at the visual representation of this this is everything I mean except for the stuff that was on tooth 19 previously all this other stuff I charted today during this webinar and so um, it's part of the patient's record. It's part of their clinical notes. Uh, it's part of their treatment planner. So all that stuff is, um, is is part of the patient record now. And if you, if for some reason you made a mistake, um, I'll just give her an example. If you if you posted the wrong stuff to one of these teeth, 
it's real simple. If, if it's stuff that you did that day, really, it's just a matter of clicking on the little pump tack and uh, and click it and delete. So it's if for some reason the doctor called out the, the wrong tooth number or uh, the next tooth wasn't selected or whatever, um, it's pretty easy to correct uh, the information you enter. Okay. Okay, cool. And so I have another question here. I think this is actually maybe two questions combined. Um, it says, we are a pedo office. Can the list of conditions and treatment plan items be customized? For example, will ankylosis teeth, rotations, partially erupted permanent teeth, et cetera, show as conditions? Also, can we delete conditions of or procedures that do not pertain to our office? Zach, I think you might be on, on mute here. Okay, can you can you hear me now? I guess uh Yeah. Guess yeah, we can time. hear you now. Sorry about well, that everybody. Hopefully all, hopefully all the previous questions were answered appropriately. Um uh but uh, as far as this is concerned with the pedo office, um all of these if it's strictly pedo, all of these conditions can be uh, and procedures can be customized to your needs. Like if I if I have like when I select a tooth, I can see all of these conditions here if I wanted to go in and customize which ones show as my favorites I can do that uh, you know if, if I don't want to say I don't want to show impacted teeth or dental restoration failure of marginal integrity I, I remove those um, these the, the list of conditions here in this list um, it's, it's about 230 conditions it used to be uh, those who used ascend uh, long enough know that the we used to have a list that was like 28 or 29 conditions and uh, they weren't really they didn't really follow as a standard per se but this uh, when we implemented quick exam I think that the, the second phase of quick exam we rolled out the entire code set of its subset of Snowdent called snow DDS GD Snowdent itself has like 8,000 diagnosis codes uh, snow DDS GD is like a subset that's 230 uh, diagnosis codes that are uh, the by far the most commonly used conditions um, in uh, in general dentist office uh, you'll notice that there's a few other aspects of each of these um, conditions that you may notice like we have ICD-10 code here uh, we have ICD-10 terminology um, and in an upcoming release, we're going to be able to uh, attach ICD-10 codes to claims. And so as you post conditions, um, when you treatment plan a procedure that will address that condition, once that procedure is included on the claim, we pull in the ICD-10 code for you. And so uh, that's that's coming up in, a, in an upcoming phase. And, and those of you who have used Quick Exam for a while know that We've released things in phases. Clinical decision support just happens to be <clears throat> one of the more recent phases, and it's uh, it's new and it's exciting. Um, uh, but this list of uh, conditions that shows up for you, you can customize to have this um, for. You may not have a tobacco user who's a who's in a pedo office. Let's just hope not. Um, and so you can remove that so it doesn't show. And as I go into uh, quick exam or even the chart because this this list is the same in the chart uh, if I click on this I no longer have uh, tobacco user as one of my conditions I go in the chart same thing this this list of favorites is the same exact list of favorites and so I no longer have tobacco user here either um, so anyway this this list of conditions is uh, is completely customizable for whatever your practice needs same thing goes for other specialties. If you're an oral surgeon um, or if you're a periodontist, there, there are some things that, you know, a patient's not going to come to your office unless uh, they have a specific condition that is unique to what your specialty is for your practice. 
So anyway, so yeah, the, the list of not only the procedures, but the conditions can be customized for you as well. Okay, and I think maybe uh, you kind of covered this, but it's it's similar enough, so I'll just bring this one up too. Um, somebody asked, they, they converted from Umbi, and they're asking, how can we delete pre-conversion conditions um, slash existing slash treatment? So I think from, you know, artifacts or from, you know, conditions that were in the software that they converted from. Okay. Um, as far as deleting, well, that's a good question because the the list of conditions we have, uh, our, our procedures, you can add and remove procedures because you may have custom procedures or whatever. The list of conditions we have, um, let me actually go into uh, our settings for those. Um, with procedure codes, you can add a new procedure code. You can add a procedure code for a Sonicare toothbrush or uh, for a consultation. Um, with conditions, our conditions stick to the SNOW DDS GD, the standardized code list. So even if someone converted from another system, the conditions that are listed will always follow whatever is in this SNOW dense standard. Um, so there really should not be something that is outside the realm of that for a new conversion. Now, with regard to uh, deleting uh, procedure codes, if there are a whole bunch of procedure codes that got pulled over when you converted from UMBI um, and you don't want to really use those anymore, they may be posted for a patient, but you may not want to even make them available on your like pick list for procedures. If that's the case, then you'll want to uh, edit the procedure and say, I'm going to make this inactive. That way, all those patients who have the procedure posted previously, it'll still show in their record. But when you're posting new procedures, that one won't be available anymore. Um, so I would recommend doing that. If you have a whole bunch of procedures in your list that you no longer want to uh, to have shown or available, I would recommend going into your procedure code settings, uh, editing the procedure, and uh, making it inactive. Okay, just reading through some of these. Um, Zach, can you, some, one person asked what an ICD-10 code is. Do you have a quick um, definition you for bet. that? You bet. Um, uh, so Snowdent, so, so let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, I think probably a good portion of this audience, if not everyone, knows what a CDT code is. Um, a CDT code is a procedure. These these indicators here, D9110, all these are procedure codes. So you can communicate to the outside world, to, to MetLife or to Delta Dental or whoever, I did this procedure. And it's uniquely identifying and they, that way that ADA knows, the payer knows, uh, another provider would know that you did this specific procedure. Full lower dental, dent, denture, excuse me, D5120, great, did it. Um, so it's a unique identifier that specifies a procedure. This is something I did. Uh, now, as far as a diagnosis, um, Snowdent is an identifier for a type of diagnosis. Um, if I say that someone has dental caries, uh, the unique identity, I mean, no one's going to, Snowdent is new enough that someone's not going to know, okay, 118065D, you know, they're not going to know that. They'll, they'll know dental caries or decay, you know, they'll know that kind of a thing. But Snowdent, um, is a fairly granular type of, if I, in fact, if I type in caries here, um, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of different kinds here. Uh, cavitated caries, cementum, enamel, root caries. There's a whole bunch of different types here that are available as part of Snowdent because to you as a practitioner, as a, as a clinician, it's important to know that it's not just caries, it's root caries. Um, and so, Knowing knowing what Snowdent is, let me now step into uh, what ICD-10 is. <clears throat> ICD-10 is like what a payer would ask for. Uh, they'll say, you know, why did you do, why did you give a crown, uh, why did you uh, deliver a crown to this patient on tooth number three? Um, they may say, you know, when, when, you, when you deliver a crown, I want you to tell me why. You, you provide a reason why. A diagnosis is the why. And so if I go up here again and I'll search for caries, um, ICD-10 is a lot more broad. Like the payer is not going to know, is it cavitated caries? Is it enamel caries? Is it root caries? <clears throat> um, you notice that a lot of these ICD-10 codes, so this, 
this stuff that's on the left hand side here snowdent and the snowdent description these are the more detailed ones that are pertinent to like your treating of the patient there in your office uh, the stuff to the right here the ICD-10 code and terminology is like the more vague stuff the stuff that like MetLife's like I don't I don't I don't care if it's uh, chronic enamel dental caries or dental caries extending into dentin you'll notice that these ICD-10 codes are exactly the same they're more specific for snow dent but they're exactly the same because they're like high level more generic um, so that they're they're really two different I don't, don't want to say languages but they're different methods of communicating what you diagnosed to the patient <clears throat> all all your you know the payer may only care okay it's dental caries unspecified but as far as you're concerned when you're treating the patient you want to know that it's incipient enamel caries you want to know that it's chronic enamel dental caries or um, even non carry non-restorable carious tooth I mean that's pretty pretty specific for Snowden but as far as ICD-10 goes the payers say eh, just send us dental caries unspecified and so it's it's more generic mechanism for specifying a diagnosis for a procedure for you know when you're justifying why you did a procedure why'd you do that crown well I, they had dental caries unspecified in your office it was a non-restorable carious tooth which is how you'll post that condition it's just when when that condition is on a claim <clears throat> it'll be submitted with the version that the payer wants which is ICD-10 sorry that was probably a little wordy but I wanted to make sure that the, the, <laughs> no, the process perfect. The, the the numbering system the coding mechanism was clear and the difference between the two because honestly when I first heard about what Snowden was going to be I, I thought well, well we already have a diagnosis coding system ICD-10 right but it's more Snowden is more specific to how you treat you want to give more quality care to your patients and so you want the more granular uh, diagnosis that Snowden can provide while still saying okay for this one condition when we tell MetLife about it let's just tell them don't, don't carry it's unspecified because because ICD-10 has no way of doing something more detailed than dental caries unspecified. So, anyway. All right, thanks. And and I have to go back to one question because I think I must have misunderstood um, the. You remember the umbi question or the conversion question that I asked um, was actually more for. She says more for wrong tooth was deleted when the tooth is actually present. So I think, um, you know, conditions or things that happen to a patient beforehand. Um, I think she's asking, how do you, how do you uh, delete uh, gotcha, previous work gotcha. from the pre-conversion? So um, <clears throat> some, some stuff from a, let's just say um, 227, let's just call 227 absent. Um, so it's a missing tooth. So it's no longer here, you go into the chart, uh, it's no longer here, uh, a big oops moment comes and you say, oh, okay, well, Tooth is actually there. Um, when you uh, go into progress notes, you can see that this condition is there. Um, and you, you can either, before I'm going to close out of that, you can either say, I've marked this condition as treated. And basically, it's like, okay, I'm going to kind of ignore that. But if, if I go in here and I say, actually, um, yeah, if I say this is treated, or basically I can invalidate this more or less. Um, and so uh, and that's kind of your way of invalidating a condition. You notice 227 is back again in both my chart and my quick exam. Uh, or you could just delete the condition. If, if I know that there are certain circumstances, I think when you may not be able to delete a condition, um, I don't recall what that is. I know that with transactions, with actual procedures, there's like a transaction lock date. And I don't, I don't recall if conditions are also subject to that. I kind of don't think so, but um but that's how you would basically get a tooth back in, in that particular example that you gave a marker tooth is missing um it's really not missing or like this one tooth number 15 it has a condition of dental caries associated with it i could mark it as treated and uh tooth number whoops i'm gonna go back to the chart tooth number 15 no longer has dental caries shown on it while at the same time we still document in the patient's clinical record that they had that at one point um, on tooth number 15. We still document it if it's just marked as treated. Hopefully that, hopefully that version of my yeah, table answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that sounded like it um, was 
you know, a lot closer to the, how I presented the question before. So thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, a couple of questions about the, I think, I think CDS's condition. So, um, one person, I guess two people asked similar questions. So one is, can you show us how to get back to the CDS list for condition? And then the other one is, um, if the CDS is changed on my login, does it also change from my coworkers' logins or, or is it just specific to mine? Okay. My login. So the, the settings for clinical decision support or CDS are for your organization. So if you've changed it for your login, it'll change it for their login. Um, now, the way you get there, there's two ways you could get there to editing your clinical decision support information. So um, one of them is here in the quick exam on this little menu, the same menu where you can enable and disable um, clinical decision support. There's a little link that'll take you to a place. Uh, it's the procedure code settings. And I'll show you another place to get here. So in here, where you look at, you're looking at conditions. And so in here, you can say, okay, when I have an impacted tooth, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click on this one. And this is my list of suggested, um, suggested work for this particular condition. When I post impacted tooth, I wanna be prompted using clinical decision support with these two procedures, or you can add to it. Uh, you can put a fairly significant number of them in there. Uh, the more you put in there, obviously, the more your list is gonna grow and it may be uh, may be counterproductive if it's way too long, but um, another place, another way you get to here, basically this is the same procedure code setting. So I'm gonna start it here at the home overview. Um, you go to settings and procedure codes and conditions. So really that, that link in uh, quick exam takes you here, actually it takes you more specifically to the conditions tab. And so it takes you right here. So you can get there those two places in quick exam and from the, the settings menu. All right. All right. A couple of questions here about supernumerary teeth. Is there a code for for those and for extracting um, a super supernumerary tooth? Uh, right now, there is there is a diagnosis code for the presence of a supernumerary tooth. It's not one of my favorites, so I'm going to search for it here. And so that the code uh, indicates that there is a supernumerary tooth. Uh, in close proximity to tooth number 27. Now, uh, if you're if you're wanting to post an extraction, uh, there's not like a, a super easy way to do that right now. I know that you can go in and, and post, uh, let's just say here, um, where's my, I wonder if I removed that from my routine extraction here. Um, there it is. So uh, I can post an extraction, and then uh, right now the, the the way we are able to do that is we uh, we edit this to a supernumerary number, which I believe, if I remember correctly, the supernumerary the number that indicates a supernumerary is adjacent to 27, as I think you add 30 to it in the U.S. numbering system. Uh, it doesn't really affect or show the chart, um, but you're able to post a procedure to a supernumerary designator uh, I mean you it still shows tooth 57 which technically is uh, the tooth number associated with that um, but uh, anyway um, let me actually find out here real quick uh, oh yeah somebody said you add 50 um, you add instead of 30 oh, is it that's a comment here yeah looks like it's 50 for supernumerary teeth Okay, so that makes that makes sense. Um, yeah, I've got a I've got a tooth numbering diagram here, so it looks like yeah, that's exactly right. So supernumerary in the universal numbering system, you add 50 to it, so you go down to tooth 30, 31 is 81. So that's exactly right. That would be 77. Somebody else mentioned that you can add S for primary teeth after the tooth yeah. letter. Yeah. So for primary teeth, the indicator is uh, is different. So going back to my little handy dandy document here, supernumerary teeth are indicated here with uh, 
A or AS, D or DS. I know this is a pretty big document. I get nerded out on stuff like this. So we've got Palmer notation, <laughs> international notation, all this stuff. <laughs> All right, well, I have another question here for you. Uh, and we have just a few minutes left, so we'll, we'll answer these until the top of the hour. Um, we often like to present multiple options of treatment, for example, bridge or implant. As long as we select all of those to be in a suggested treatment, we can still do that. Oh, can, let's see, we can still do that and organize in the treatment planner, correct? That's exactly right. So um, I've got here uh, for this particular option, 9, 10, 11, I'll do a, a bridge there, and I'll go to um, just select number 10, and I'll say that that's going to be a uh, implant with crown. So th these things are already posted. I'm going to go to my treatment planner, and I apologize. This is this is the patient I use for my test here, but all these things. Uh, sorry, what tooth was I? That was uh, 9, 10, 11, I believe. So. Um, See, we had the implant here. Let's put that into its own case. Um, and I will take, let's see. Whoops, I think I moved the wrong thing. I meant to do that one in that case. So, but yeah, it basically, it, the, same, the same exact mechanism. The, the difference is that you can get those into your treatment plan a lot quicker using quick exam. Um, a couple a couple clicks quicker than you would in the chart. So same exact uh, workflow. You'd go into the, the treatment planner, you know, or arrange your things into into different cases here. You got your you'd have your implant one and your um, your bridge case here. So same thing. All right. Um, if the doctor wants to keep watch on a tooth, is there any way to chart that in Quick Exam? Um, the uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna select Tiny Tim here. I'm charting too much stuff to to Bob Cratchit. Let me uh, go in here. So if there's a watch tooth, um, there still is a watch tooth condition. The ADA uh, who helped us map our existing um, conditions over to the standard Snowdent ones uh, said that the it's also referred to as delay treatment. Like basically like don't do anything on it right now, uh, but watch it. So you you select a tooth and say watch tooth it does the same watch tooth indicator in the chart as it was there before with places a w next to something you want to watch so that's how that's done yeah perfect all right and somebody's asking for a clarification uh real quick zach on the settings being turned off for cbs being a workstation specific it sounds like um there was maybe an understanding or confusion of uh, whether or not the CDS is, if you turn it off, is that workstation specific or account specific? Ah, uh, gotcha. Um, okay, sorry. I, I thought you were talking about the the list of procedures that showed in clinical decision support. Gotcha. Okay, so the the mapping of dental caries should pr prompt me with these procedures. That is organization wide. Now, whether or not it's turned on um, is is actually a workstation specific setting. So I may I may have this enabled in in one operatory but not another. <clears throat> the little uh, treatment hints. So that is I apologize for missing that uh, the basis of that question before, but yeah, that that little yes no switch is the thing that is uh, a workstation specific setting. Okay, perfect. All right, and then maybe uh, let's see. You know, back to the watching. Um, the watch tooth. Can you indicate surface is being watched? Um, the the watch condition is really just a tooth specific thing. If there is a if there is a desire to uh, specify that, uh, there's always a note that you can associate with it. But the watch tooth is a it's not a surface specific condition like like caries is, um, or you know an impacted direction kind of a thing. It's it's a tooth specific thing because you could be watching it. For any number of reasons, you could be watching it because there's um, there may be some uh, something on the root of the tooth or uh, at the apex of the roots, something like that. You may be um, you may want to uh, 
specify. So you can actually see uh, in the note which ones you're watching. Because really it is a, a fairly flexible, um, generic, I want to watch this tooth. Um, and so it's rather, than, if, if we made watch tooth surface specific and someone wanted to, to post something that is uh, for a root or um, um, anyway, if, if it was just for the, the tooth itself, like if there's something with regard to uh, another aspect of the tooth, the dentin or whatever. Um, anyway, so that would be, uh, it's just a tooth specific thing. I'd recommend using a note for that if you have a watch tooth label. Perfect. Great. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. Thanks uh, for all your participation in sending all these questions. Hopefully, we're able to answer most of the questions. Um, I don't know. I mean, feel free. I mean, do you have a slide, Zach, that shows your contact information? I mean, you can feel free to email us afterwards or um, I, can, I guess um, I can. I don't have a mine, slide that my, says that, but if you uh, give me a moment, I could put it right up here. Um, yeah, I guess that pulled up. And and uh, by the way, after uh, this is completed, we'll we'll be sending out a recording of this um, Friday forum out as we do. Um, so you can look out for for that in your email to all the registrants. If even if they weren't able to attend, we'll be able to send out these these questions or sorry the 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 Friday forum the webinar here. So um, if you have that, do you just want to state what that is? Let me, uh, let me actually go back to this slide that's got my, there we go. There we go. Zach Church at zach.church at henryshine1.com. And with that, this concludes our, our webinar, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Um, thanks, thanks for joining.